I work in the Mozilla Cloud Services Group, we used to be the identity group. And today I'm going to talk about the cryptography that we're using in Firefox Sync. This is uh, describing what we've changed in Firefox Sync over the last couple of years. So it's actually a story about three different protocols. The one that we were using originally, uh, an intermediate one we put together last fall that we ended up not using, and I'll explain a little bit about why. And the system that we're using now that was just released last week in Firefox 29 is now live. And I'll talk a little bit about the uh, problems that we've observed with these different protocols and the compromises that have been made. <coughs> so the Firefox uh, Sync story starts back in 2007. Um, at that point, uh, keeping bookmarks in sync between multiple browsers was kind of a hassle. There were a bunch of third-party add-ons that uh, could provide this for you. But a lot of them weren't doing, um, they weren't really built into the server. And they didn't, uh, didn't provide for a lot of different data types. So getting your password synchronized from one machine to another, use a different add-on, getting open tabs, getting form fill data, um, maybe it was a third add-on, maybe it didn't exist at all. And most of those systems kept all of your data in plain text on the server. Uh, there wasn't any encryption that was getting built into it, and a lot of people were nervous about that. So in late 2007, the Mozilla Labs team created an extension called Weave to try and address this. When I joined in 2009, I uh, think they were looking pretty good. It was synchronizing all the different data types, um, uh, built in Firefox, and includes open tabs, which is kind of cool because you can be using your browser uh, at work. You open a tab showing the, the map to the restaurant you're going to go to that night. You walk away from your desk, you pull out your phone. Hey, great, there's um, the, uh, the map that's right there. It's already synchronized over. They had synchronized history, which is pretty cool because that's what's used to drive the recommendation engine when you start typing stuff into the, the awesome box in Firefox. And it synchronizes the password manager database, which is great because it uh, helps people get away from manually memorizing passwords, which means they won't be very good ones. Having machine assistance for that is the first step towards um, improving passwords and eventually getting rid of the passwords altogether. So because we were synchronizing passwords and because we were really committed to privacy, it was really important to us that everything be encrypted in an end-to-end fashion. So from the very beginning, uh, sync, uh, we just need it out on synchronized everything, uh, encrypted everything before it went to a computer. The original version of this had an extra passphrase, this uh, uh, extra box down at the bottom of the secret phrase that was used to generate the encryption key that um, encrypted all of your data. Uh, there's some extra crypto involved in that that I'm going to skip over. Uh, that's used to derive some other keys, there's different collection keys and stuff like that. But we all know how lousy passwords are, and so when we were looking at this back in 2009 or so, we were worried about people using bad passwords to encrypt all the rest of their passwords, and we were trying to find an alternative. And about this time, somebody told me about the JPEG algorithm. This is a member of the Password Authenticated Key Exchange, the PAKE family of algorithms, that lets two parties safely bootstrap from a short, low entropy shared secret into a full strength session key. You're basically trading off round trips in exchange for a stronger security level. So even an active man mill attack uh, only gets one guess. You know, each time one party is willing to start this process, the man in the middle gets one chance to guess whatever the shared secret is. And this relates to some of what Trevor was talking about with trying to set up the encrypted message channels. The crypto community has a lot of experience with fake algorithms, but they aren't really that common in the wild. Uh, SRP is the most well-known fake algorithm, but it's, even so, it's kind of hard to find examples of it being used in large deployed systems. Um, SRP is an augmented fake, which means that the server side has a different value, it has um, something derived from the shared secret. And that gives you this nice property where if you break into the server and you steal all those things, you can't use those values directly to log into one of these systems. JPEG is a balanced peg, so both sides are using the same, uh, same starting string, the same password. So it was a little bit crazy and experimental, but that's what Labs was all about. Um, so in 2010, we, we glued JPEG into Weave. We said that the first time you set up sync, your, your device is going to make up a new random encryption key. It's going to use that to encrypt all your bookmarks, open tabs, passwords, whatnot, before it sends it up to the server. And it reduces the problem to one of trying to get that randomly generated encryption key off to your second device, off to your third device. So we describe this as, as pairing devices together. When you want to add a second device to your sync account, you would um, start the second device up. It would say, hey, here's a short random JPEG code. Go and type that into your other box. Now, you, now, both boxes have that JPEG code. They do this JPEG algorithm. They wind up with a strong session key. They use that to transfer over all of the credentials, including that randomly generated encryption key, over to the second device. Now, both machines have everything they need to get out your data. Good, now you're ready to go. That's, it's a single-use um, JPEG key. It's a pretty short code. Um, 
And the nice thing about it was that you don't have to remember a strong password to get strong security. In, in at least our idealized model of this, there were no passwords involved. You have that one machine, you pair a second machine, pair a third machine, a fourth machine. Um, and so in uh, 2011, we shipped Firefox 4.0 with the JFake based Weave plugin. Uh, this was made into a standard feature. It's um, advertised when you start the browser to say, sign up for Firefox Sync. Uh, Firefox Sync sounds a lot more official than Weave, um, change the logo. And this was also when we released Firefox for Android. So this was a big selling point. Hey, <clears throat> you can now synchronize your desktop stuff with your mobile phone browser. Um, this is what it looks like when you set up a browser the first time. It's using a, a 12 character base, six, base uh, 32 sync code. The first four characters are providing a channel ID, so one browser can figure out where the other browser is that you want to talk to. And uh, the other 40 bits are the JPEG secret. You could probably make this a lot shorter, but we were being pretty conservative at the same time. So then on your second browser, you pair the device, you, you just type that pairing code into this device. Um, and in theory, this should have been awesome. You know, there are no passwords to remember, there are no keys to manage, but all of your data is encrypted for the full strength key. It's encrypted against the server. There's nothing that Mozilla can do to kind of, you know, break into the stuff or somebody who breaks into our server can't see your stuff. Adding a new device looks a lot like pairing a Bluetooth keyboard, um, something like that. All you have to do is type in a few characters. I'm still pretty proud of this scheme, and everything, every security person I've ever described this to loves it. They're like, oh, that's, that's beautiful. No passwords, that's wonderful. But what we've kind of learned is that most of the people actually try to use this just hate it. They, they get really, really confused. Um, and what I've learned is that I need to talk to more people than just security groups. <laughs> 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 there are people out there that want to um, So some of these quotes, these are, our secu are uh, some quotes from our support forum from about uh, last December. Um, and the first one is great. It's like, I cannot for the life of me figure out Firefox. There are a lot of people that were expecting this to behave like a more traditional type in a username, type in a password, be able to type that anywhere and get to your stuff. Some of the problems people ran into are fairly shallow, but some of them are actually pretty deep. Um, and what, what we found was that uh, the account creation process is actually kind of deceptive. The UI that, that people walk through ends up tricking them into believing it behaves differently than they believe it. When I was working on this protocol, I had this kind of platonic ideal in my head of no passwords anywhere. And the setup process on the first device should have one button that just says, yes, synchronize my stuff. And then this, so the second device, that's when you start getting into this pairing thing. So the, the first problem we kind of identified was that uh, what resulted from the fact that our fancy pairing scheme replaced the passphrase. So basically what we did there, the randomly generated encryption key slotted into the existing uh, sync hardware, uh, the sync mechanism, by replacing that passphrase. So we randomly generate the passphrase for you and then we transfer that, that passphrase from one machine to another parent. So we replaced the passphrase, but for a variety of reasons, when we first built this, we actually retained the email address and account password. Uh, it made sense at the time. We kind of wanted this to be, uh, we wanted the ability to contact users in case something went wrong. So we thought, okay, having email address, that's always good. Every account system should be based on email addresses. We want to give people the ability to delete their entire account, even if you've lost all the devices um, that, that attach to it. So, okay, you need your password so we can tell whether you are allowed to delete your stuff or not. Um, and, and the longer term vision was to have this turn into more generalized accounts. So we thought, well, we might use this password in other places, so we should have one of these. But the fact that this looks exactly like the sign-in dialog on any, on any regular username plus password system uh, tricked people into thinking that sync behaved the same way. and they, they falsely believed that this password was actually important. They thought this is what was protecting their data. And so um, they would dutifully write it down and then discover later that actually you never use this password ever again. This, this account creation box is the only time you ever type in this password. Because when you pair stuff to a second machine, it pairs over this password as well as everything else. So when we, another problem though that we saw, when we looked at the stats, we found that over half the people using Firefox Sync only had one device on their account. And if you think about the way the pairing works, it's clear that those people are getting zero value out of it. There's this randomly generated encryption key that exists on that one device, and there's ciphertext that is tied to that one key, and there's nothing else in the entire world that knows how to decrypt that data. Um, so they weren't exactly doing end-to-end -end encryption, they were just doing end encryption. <laughs> um, so something's pretty long. And then when those folks lost that one device, their hard drive broke, they, they lost their phone or whatever, they'd want to recover data, and they'd hit the, the, they get a new phone, the new browser, hit the setup sync button, and they'd see this dialog to say, okay, yeah, time to go and set up sync. And they say, yeah, sure, I have an account button, I'll go use that. And then they see this parent, <laughs> button, 
And this was the first time these people had ever seen this, right? They, they think they've been happily using sync for a year with that end to the And they'd see this and be like, oh, is this? What the fuck? Um, so, and eventually they see the little note in the corner that says, I don't have this device with me. And we put that there to deal with the desktop to desktop case, where I don't have my phone, I have my laptop at work, I have my, my desktop at home. Um, I can't get the code from one device to another because these things are three miles apart and they're both like chained to the wall or something. Um, so, they, so that was intended there to provide for that case. And they see the link and they say, you're right, yeah. I thought it was a final phone testimonial. As a security intern, I did this exact thing on my first day. Of yeah, excellent. It's, excellent. It's, uh, it's, everybody gets it. Right? Um, so they see this link and they'd be thinking, of course I don't have this device with me. That was the laptop that my fiber roll just dropped into the fish tank. And so they push the button and they get to this sign in page that looks almost like what they were expecting. They were expecting to do some, something that has email address and password because they think the password matters. And then they discover there's this weird sync key. And they never heard anything about that. And this was actually a, a um, fallback mechanism that we put into place. So that if you knew about it, and you kind of dive through the preferences menus, you can get to a place that will tell you what that randomly generated raw encryption key is. And you could write that down, and you could type it back in here, and you could get back, back to your data. But because everything was supposed to happen with pairing, we never emphasized that. And it was kind of impossible to discover unless you hit the support forums that you get to by finding this show me how I've lost my other device link, which tells you, hey dummy, two years ago you should have gone and written that thing down. It sucks to you. <laughs> so this is where most people just kind of start screaming and getting really frustrated and write it to our support forum saying, I cannot for life without you. Life would need to figure out Firefox. Um, so the net result is we basically built the wrong thing. We came up with this really elegant solution to a problem that was different than what most people actually had. It solves, uh, it provides for a couple of people's needs really well, but it leaves an awful lot of people just completely bewildered. So we designed the pairing thing to work great for two, three, four, multiple devices, and we expected that people who only had one device would look at the look at the label on the tin, you know, they say, oh, what a shame, this isn't for me, I guess I just won't use it. And instead they thought, great, it's a sync thing, I'll just use it. Um, and it also didn't help that, that uh, about the same time, just after we shipped this, a bunch of other products came out of the market that used sync in the name, meaning the more traditional username and password approach. So in some ways, the vocabulary got taken out from us. So the identity group, my team was tasked with uh, fixing sync. And the instructions were replace this with something that, that looks familiar that people can actually use. Um, and there are a bunch of different uh, competing constraints as, as usual. Uh, there, some people want their data to be secure. They don't really know what that means, but they know encryption is probably a good part of it. Um, something uh, secure, so secure that the server can't break in is, is a really good feature for people who really like that one. Um, other folks want to get their data back uh, by remembering the password. There are folks that say the password is too weak. I want to make sure that somebody who can get my password can't get to the data. Uh, there are some folks that want to get their data back even if they forget the password. Um, and then sometimes those same people also want the data to be so secure the server can't read it. They don't quite understand the contribution. <laughs> but the overall product design we received was to make it look like a normal sync system. So we start with the email address and the password, and we have to, as, as designers, our task is to make it as secure as possible within those constraints. So this is the, the, the second protocol that I'm talking about. This is not the one that we're shipping right now, but this is what we designed uh, last summer, last fall, and then back away from it. Um, the client starts with the user's email address and passwords uh, up in the top left there. And the goal is to wind up with a session token that allows it to talk to the storage servers and the encryption keys that it needs to encrypt all your bookmark password stuff before it's sent it to the storage server. Um, so the encryption key is going to pop out down the bottom left. The, to resolve the contradiction between wanting something that is secure against the server and wanting something that's recoverable even if you forget your password, we decided to define two different classes of data protection. With the idea that maybe users could choose which one they wanted, maybe have some preferences, many of the flips between them, or maybe the product designer folks just make that decision on behalf of our users and say, here's the default. If you want to figure out something different, dive into preferences. Um, we didn't know what the default would be or what the UI would look like, but we figured by designing the protocol to handle both, then eventually we'd be able to, to satisfy whatever decision. So we find class A, the first protection class, to be data that you can recover if you can prove control over your account. So even if you forget the password, the server can give you back this, this encryption key. So KA is this master encryption key 
that the server knows and is willing to give it to you under certain circumstances. That's sort of how we're going. We define class B to mean data that uh, requires knowledge of the password to access. So this is encrypted with a key that is not known to the server. The server is holding a wrapped copy of it. And the idea is that you need to know your password and be able to convince the server to give you the wrapped copy to unwrap it, get back, KB. And both of these keys are, are master keys. We derive different uh, forms of them with HKDF in order to encrypt data for different purposes of sync being one of those purposes. So to make that safe, we need to make sure the, the server never actually learns the user password. Um, there's kind of a spectrum of what it means to know somebody's password. It's like level zero means this is the password. You know what it is. Level one is here's the hash of the password. If you have a dictionary and enough computer time, you might be able to figure out what it is, depending on how I choose it. And then like level two, three, up to bazillion, is you have to use more CPU time because the hashing function, whatever the one-way function is, the key stretching function, is more and more computation intense. So in this protocol, to protect the user's password, we run the, the user's password through a full second of the S-script algorithm uh, using 64K81 uh, parameters to it. Uh, this uses about 64 megabytes of RAM, and it runs on the client side. So we do all the stretching over the client side before we do anything else with it. We salt it with the user's email address to avoid waiting for the round trip uh, to the server to find out what salts to use. So it's, it's a unique hash for, uh, for each user. And we use HKDX to derive two different independent values from the stretch password. We hold one of them in reserve locally to unwrap the, the class B key later, and we use the other one to do an SRP protocol dance with the server. So this, uh, the second derivative is fed into SRP as the, as the password. We've previously established a verifier on the server side. They do the SRP dance. They wind up with a strong session key. That strong session key is used to transfer the a session token over to transfer over the wrapped uh, KV key. And the nice thing about using SRP for this purpose is that it's protected against man middles. It's protected against eavesdroppers. And a man in the middle only gets one guess. Just like the JPEG stuff, um, if somebody has completely broken your TLS connection, if somebody has uh, gotten into your data center and is watching all the traffic coming out of the, the TLS terminators, then they, uh, as a passive adversary, they get no information about the session key. As an active adversary, they get one guess, which not be um, Everything's running over TLS, of course, but it makes me feel a lot better to not have it working. So the, the weakest point of this whole thing is account creation, where you have to send the verifier over to the server. That value can be used to do a brute force attack against the, the password, but nothing else in the entire system that's on the wire can be used for any kind of attack. And the value that's stored in the server uh, only enables a very expensive kind of attack. You have to do a full set investment. So this is pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. We implemented it um, and got everything working, but we, we were getting some grumbling and pushback from it. Um, the full spec, once you actually draw out all the corner cases, changing passwords, if you forget the password, you have to reset the account, and, and key changes, you lose the server data. But actually implementing that, uh, it starts looking pretty complex. Um, in addition, SRP is kind of un underspecified. Um, it's, it's not like a 25519, where it's like, hey, there's a paper, there's an implementation, everybody uses the same thing. With SRP, you have to choose a group, you have to choose how you encode all the parameters. Um, we had to go write our own implementation for it, which makes everybody really nervous. So uh, that's a problem. Another problem with using SRP or any case implementation is that all of the stretching you're ever going to do happens on the client. Before you send that, before you start the SRP conversation, before you can create the verifier, uh, you've got to do all your stretching on the client side because there is no way to do stretching of the SRP verifier once it's over on the client server side. So that means that whatever protection we're going to get against dictionary attacks has to happen on the client. And these clients, they're mobile phones. You know, we're making this $25 uh, Firefox OS phone. Um, cheap, slow, low memory, not a great environment to do uh, intensive computation. And certainly not a very consistent environment. So on some devices, it might be really fast, and others might be really slow. And we knew that we could never really um, make it better uh, on the server side. You know, if, if we decide tomorrow, hey, we've got faster computers, we've got more memory, let's make better, let's get better protection, we couldn't do that without going back to the clients and having them kind of recompute the stuff. Um, and in addition, the, the more crypto you use, the more people get nervous that they couldn't possibly implement that correctly. So there's this other weird engineering constraint that we want to make things as simple as possible for the folks that have to go. They have to make it look simple. Um, finally, uh, we had some additional scope creep. We started introducing Firefox accounts. We had other folks saying, I want this to be a more general purpose login mechanism. Different audiences saying, I don't care about this crypto, this encryption stuff you're using, I just want that like, accounts with the password. 
So we needed to make sure that um, this uh, that the password that's getting used here is not revealed to the server um, and deal with more, more developers that run client tools. So any complexity there is good. So we went back to the drawing board and put together this protocol we call one password. Uh, this is what we're shipping. This is what got shipped um, last week in 29. Um, so this removes SRP. Uh, it's, it's doing minimal uh, stretching on the client side. Uh, we start by doing 1,000 rounds of PPKDF over on the client side. We split into two values like we did before, the old one and the zero, and we just send the other one over the wire. So we're totally relying, we're, we're mostly relying on TLS here. Um, on the server side, it's going to do more intensive stretching. It does the same S script as before, and it uses that to protect the values that are stored in the database. It's using that to compare against the verifier in the database to see whether you would know the password or not. Um, and then it's using that to unwrap the values that get sent back over to the, the client side. Um, so against a, it's just as strong as the, against the previous one, uh, against a pass, they might call a passive server attack. This is one where somebody gets a SQL exploit, somebody gets a copy of your backup tape, they somehow get a copy of your database and they can move the values out of there. And the value that is in the database, um, in order to use that for brute force attack against the password, you have to go through the script step for each guest. So that's, that's the expensive path to try and do a brute force attack. Um, it's weaker against what you might call an active server attack, where somebody either gets to see inside your TLS connection, they get to see the plain text after it comes out of the Terminator, or not forget, they actually take over the entire server and they get to see all the values, you know, they complete only um, control over the, the server's activity. Um, that kind of attacker learns the off PW value, this thing that's the output of the thousand rounds of PDA abstract. So they have a, a cheaper dictionary attack, but it's still it's still a, a dictionary attack. Um, it's, it's still uh, a lot of work. And somebody who can forge a TLS certificate um, and gets in the middle of your conversation gets the same. Um, but a, a client that simply wants to prove control over the account and doesn't care about these encryption keys, it can be pretty simple. You have to teach them how PDKDF works, you have to teach them what HKDF works, but that's just hashing functions, that's all symmetric stuff. That can run in JavaScript really fast. Um, the PDKDF stretch is pretty easy and it runs pretty quickly, uh, even in JavaScript. And the worst case for this is probably an old copy of Internet Explorer on a really slow computer because the JavaScript engine wasn't that good. Um, but, but even a low-power mobile phone can do a thousand ounce uh, without too much trouble. Does that much stretching really help? That's a really interesting question. There's a spectrum of how good is the password and how much stretching do you need to make it any better. There's kind of a, a, a low-end range of bad passwords and no amount of stretching is that going to help. There's a high-end range of good passwords where stretching doesn't matter. And so there's really this kind of middle ground and we're, we're nudging that over a little bit depending on how much stretching. So this is what we built. Uh, this is what ships last week in Firefox 29. Um, it's ramping up a lot faster than, than the previous pairing thing did. Or as of yesterday, we're getting 40,000 users per day signing up for it. And it gets, uh, the upgrade process gets on throttles tomorrow. So every Firefox 28 user will be uh, encouraged to upgrade Firefox 29 tomorrow, and the servers might even survive it. Um, but uh, so this, we think this is a good compromise between usability and security for our users. Um, some future directions we're looking at, we've built up a pretty enthusiastic following for the pairing scheme. You know, anytime you make a change like this, you get people coming out of the virtual room saying, no, oh, you're going to kill my users. That's um, so uh, you might call this the Pope mobile level of security. And we're trying to figure out how to retain that level of security for people that want it. So we're looking into ways to reintroduce pairing as a secondary step. Maybe you set up the account, you type in your password to connect to it, and then you push the button that says, raise my account to Pope mobile security level. And that means that you have to pair a new device to the old device. And that's the only way to get them. Um, but uh, if you just use a good password, then, then you're, you're, you're totally safe here. Um, and we think that we can do better with pairing this time around because we have more information about which devices you already have access to. We don't need the pairing code to tell us which account you're trying to attach to, which means we can make it a lot shorter. We can probably get away with three or four digits. <coughs> And we know the other devices that are currently active on your account, which means we can send a message to them to provoke them to pop up a dialogue where you type the box to type in the pairing. So instead of getting text instructions on one machine to tell you how to hunt around in the preferences menu on the other one to find the right place, as soon as you push the button that says, I'd like to pair this, this button can pop up and say, do you want to dialogue on the pair? Um, and of course, we, we have plans to add two-factor off into this. Um, and we're trying to figure out, you know, uh, Google Authenticator or HG. 
So for more information, we have um, uh, a couple of uh, wiki pages that describe these different protocols. Um, the old protocol, if you're interested in the SRP stuff, it has a link there. And there's a copy of the slides if, uh, if you want to go to that. And take some questions. So good question.